Christ came to reveal God to the world as a God of love, full of mercy, tenderness, and compassion. The thick darkness with which Satan had endeavored to enshroud the throne of deity was swept away by the world's Redeemer, and the Father was again manifest to men as the light of life. When Philip came to Jesus with the request, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. The Savior answered him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Christ declares himself to be sent into the world as a representative of the Father. In his nobility of character, in his mercy and tender pity, in his love and goodness, he stands before us as the embodiment of divine perfection, the image of the invisible God. Says the apostle, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Only as we contemplate the great plan of redemption can we have a just appreciation of the character of God. The work of creation was a manifestation of his love, but the gift of God to save the guilty and ruined race alone reveals the infinite depths of divine tenderness and compassion. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. While the law of God is maintained and its justice vindicated, the sinner can be pardoned. The dearest gift that heaven itself had to bestow has been poured out that God might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. By that gift, men are uplifted from the ruin and degradation of sin to become children of God. Says Paul, Ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Brethren, with the beloved John, I call upon you to behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. What love, what matchless love, that sinners and aliens as we are, we may be brought back to God and adopted into his family. We may address him by the endearing name, Our Father, which is a sign of our affection for him, and a pledge of his tender regard and relationship to us. And the Son of God, beholding the heirs of grace, is not ashamed to call them brethren. They have even a more sacred relationship to God than have the angels who have never fallen. All the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men are but a tiny rill to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it. Pen cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day of your life. You may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and compassion of the Heavenly Father, and yet there is an infinity beyond. You may study that love for ages, yet you can never fully comprehend the length and breadth, the depth and the height of the love of God in giving His Son to die for the world. Eternity itself can never fully reveal it. Yet as we study the Bible and meditate upon the life of Christ and the plan of redemption, these great themes will open to our understanding more and more.
and it will be ours to realize the blessing which Paul desired for the Ephesian church when he prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. It is Satan's constant study to keep the minds of men occupied with those things which will prevent them from obtaining the knowledge of God. He seeks to keep them dwelling upon what will darken the understanding and discourage the soul. We are in a world of sin and corruption, surrounded by influences that tend to allure or dishearten the followers of Christ. The Savior said, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Many fix their eyes upon the terrible wickedness existing around them the apostasy and weakness on every side, and they talk of these things until their hearts are filled with sadness and doubt. They keep uppermost before the mind the masterly working of the arch-deceiver and dwell upon the discouraging features of their experience while they seem to lose sight of the Heavenly Father's power and His matchless love. All this is as Satan would have it. It is a mistake to think of the enemy of righteousness as clothed with so great power when we dwell so little upon the love of God and His might. We must talk of the mightiness of Christ. We are utterly powerless to rescue ourselves from the grasp of Satan, but God has appointed a way of escape. The Son of the Highest has strength to fight the battle for us and through him that loved us we may come off more than conquerors. There is no spiritual strength for us in constantly brooding over our weakness and backslidings and bemoaning the power of Satan. This great truth must be established as a living principle in our minds and hearts, the efficacy of the offering made for us, that God can and does save to the uttermost all who come unto him complying with the conditions specified in his word. Our work is to place our will on the side of God's will. Then, through the blood of the atonement, we become partakers of the divine nature. Through Christ, we are children of God. And we have the assurance that God loves us even as he loved his Son. We are one with Jesus. We walk where Christ leads the way. He has power to dispel the dark shadows which Satan casts across our path. And in place of darkness and discouragement, the sunlight of his glory shines into our hearts. Our hope is to be constantly strengthened by the knowledge that Christ is our righteousness. Let our faith rest upon this foundation, for it will stand fast forever. Instead of dwelling upon the darkness of Satan and fearing his power, we should open our hearts to receive light from Christ and let it shine forth to the world, declaring that he is above all the power of Satan that his sustaining arm will support all who trust in him. Said Jesus, the Father himself loveth you. If our faith is fixed upon God, through Christ it will prove as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered. It is true that disappointments will come. Tribulation we must expect. But we are to commit everything, great and small, to God. He does not become perplexed by the multiplicity of our grievances, nor overpowered by the weight of our burdens. His watch care extends to every household and encircles every individual. 
He is concerned in all our business and our sorrows. He marks every tear. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. All the afflictions and trials that befall us here are permitted to work out His purposes of love toward us that we might be partakers of His holiness and thus become participants in that fullness of joy which is found in His presence. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But the Bible, in strongest terms, sets before us the importance of obtaining a knowledge of God. Says Peter, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And the Scripture bids us, Acquaint now thyself with Him, and be at peace. God has commanded us, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And an inspired apostle declares that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Holiness is agreement with God. By sin, the image of God in man has been marred and well-nigh obliterated. It is the work of the gospel to restore that which has been lost. And we are to cooperate with the divine agency in this work. And how can we come into harmony with God? How shall we receive His likeness unless we obtain a knowledge of Him? It is this knowledge that Christ came into the world to reveal unto us. The meager views which so many have had of the exalted character and office of Christ have narrowed their religious experience and have greatly hindered their progress in the divine life. Personal religion among us as a people is at a low ebb. There is much form, much machinery, much tongue religion, but something deeper and more solid must be brought into our religious experience. With all our facilities, our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, and many, many other advantages, we ought to be far in advance of our present position. It is the work of the Christian in this life to represent Christ to the world in life and character unfolding the blessed Jesus if God has given us light, it is that we may reveal it to others. But in comparison with the light we have received and the opportunities and privileges granted us to reach the hearts of the people, the results of our work thus far have been far too small. God designs that the truth which He has brought to our understanding shall produce more fruit than has yet been revealed. But when our minds are filled with gloom and sadness, dwelling upon the darkness and evil around us, how can we represent Christ to the world? How can our testimony have power to win souls? What we need is to know God and the power of His love as revealed in Christ by an experimental knowledge. We must search the Scriptures diligently, prayerfully. Our understanding must be quickened by the Holy Spirit, and our hearts must be uplifted to God in faith and hope and continual praise. Through the merits of Christ, through His righteousness, which by faith is imputed unto us, we are to attain to the perfection of Christian character. Our daily and hourly work is set forth in the words of the Apostle, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. While doing this, our minds become clearer and our faith stronger, and our hope is confirmed. We are so engrossed with the view of His purity and loveliness and the sacrifice He has made to bring us into agreement with God that we have no disposition to speak of doubts and discouragements. 
the manifestation of God's love, His mercy and His goodness, and the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart to enlighten and renew it, place us, through faith, in so close connection with Christ that having a clear conception of His character, we are able to discern the masterly deceptions of Satan. Looking unto Jesus and trusting in His merits, we appropriate the blessings of light, of peace, of joy in the Holy Ghost. And in view of the great things which Christ has done for us, we are ready to exclaim, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Brethren and sisters, it is by beholding that we become changed. By dwelling upon the love of God and our Savior, by contemplating the perfection of the divine character and claiming the righteousness of Christ as ours by faith, we are to be transformed into the same image. Then let us not gather together all the unpleasant pictures, the iniquities and corruptions and disappointments, the evidences of Satan's power to hang in the halls of our memory, to talk over and mourn over until our souls are filled with discouragement. A discouraged soul is a body of darkness, not only failing himself to receive the light of God, but shutting it away from others. Satan loves to see the effect of the pictures of his triumphs, making human beings faithless and disheartened. There are, thank God, brighter and more cheering pictures which the Lord has presented to us. Let us group together the blessed assurances of His love as precious treasures that we may look upon them continually, the Son of God leaving His Father's throne, clothing His divinity with humanity that He might rescue man from the power of Satan, His triumph in our behalf, opening heaven to man, revealing to human vision the presence chamber where deity unveils his glory. The fallen race, uplifted from the pit of ruin into which sin has plunged them, and brought them again into connection with the infinite God, and having endured the divine test through faith in our Redeemer, clothed in the righteousness of Christ and exalted to his throne, these are the pictures with which God bids us gladden the chambers of the soul. And while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, we shall prove it true that in our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In heaven... God is all in all. Their holiness reigns supreme. There is nothing to mar the perfect harmony with God. If we are indeed journeying thither, the Spirit of heaven will dwell in our hearts here. But if we find no pleasure now in the contemplation of heavenly things, if we have no interest in seeking the knowledge of God, no delight in beholding the character of Christ, if holiness has no attractions for us, then we may be sure that our hope of heaven is vain. Perfect conformity to the will of God is the high aim to be constantly before the Christian. He will love to talk of God, of Jesus, of the home of bliss and purity which Christ has prepared for them that love him. The contemplation of these themes, when the soul feasts upon the blessed assurances of God, the apostle represents as tasting the powers of the world to come. Just before us is the closing struggle of the great controversy when with all power and signs and lying wonders, when with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, Satan is to work to misrepresent the character of God, that he may seduce, if it were possible, 
even the elect. If there was ever a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that in this time of peril God has called to be the depositaries of his holy law and to vindicate his character before the world. Those to whom has been committed a trust so sacred must be spiritualized, elevated, vitalized by the truths they profess to believe. Never did the church more sorely need, and never was God more solicitous than she should enjoy the experience described in Paul's letter to the Colossians when he wrote, We do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Chapter 59 The Word Made Flesh The union of the divine with the human nature is one of the most precious and most mysterious truths of the plan of redemption. It is this of which Paul speaks when he says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. This truth has been to many a cause of doubt and unbelief. When Christ came into the world, the Son of God and the Son of Man, he was not understood by the people of his time. Christ stooped to take upon himself human nature, that he might reach the fallen race and lift them up. But the minds of men had become darkened by sin, their faculties were benumbed and their perceptions dulled, so that they could not discern his divine character beneath the garb of humanity. This lack of appreciation on their part was an obstacle to the work which he desired to accomplish for them. And in order to give force to his teaching, he was often under the necessity of defining and defending his position. By referring to his mysterious and divine character, he sought to lead their minds into a train of thought which would be favorable to the transforming power of truth. Again, he used the things of nature with which they were familiar to illustrate divine truth. The soil of the heart was thus prepared to receive the good seed. He made his hearers feel that his interests were identified with theirs, that his heart beat in sympathy with them in their joys and griefs. At the same time, they saw in him the manifestation of power and excellence far above that possessed by their most honored rabbis. The teachings of Christ were marked with a simplicity, dignity, and power heretofore unknown to them, and their involuntary exclamation was, Never man spake like this man. The people listened to him gladly, but the priests and rulers themselves false to their trust as guardians of the truth, hated Christ for the very grace revealed, which had drawn the multitudes away from them to follow the light of life. Through their influence, the Jewish nation, failing to discern his divine character, rejected the Redeemer. The union of the divine and the human manifest in Christ exists also in the Bible. The truths revealed are all given by inspiration of God, yet they are expressed in the words of men and are adapted to human needs. Thus it may be said of the book of God as it was of Christ that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And this fact so far from being an argument against the Bible, should strengthen faith in it as the Word of God. Those who pronounce upon the inspiration of the Scriptures, accepting some portions as divine while they reject other parts as human, overlook the fact that Christ, the divine, 
partook of our human nature that he might reach humanity. In the work of God for man's redemption, divinity and humanity are combined. There are many passages of Scripture which skeptical critics have declared to be uninspired, but which in their tender adaptation to the needs of men are God's own messages of comfort to his trusting children. A beautiful illustration of this occurs in the history of the Apostle Peter. Peter was in prison, expecting to be brought forth next day to death. He was sleeping at night between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Peter, suddenly awakening, was amazed at the brightness that flooded his dungeon and the celestial beauty of the heavenly messenger. He understood not the scene, but he knew that he was free, and in his bewilderment and joy he would have gone forth from the prison unprotected from the cold night air. The angel of God, noting all the circumstances, said with tender care for the apostle's need, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. Peter mechanically obeyed. But so entranced was he with the revelation of the glory of heaven that he did not think to take his cloak. Then the angel bade him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. The apostle found himself in the streets of Jerusalem alone. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety. It was not a dream or a vision, but an actual occurrence, that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews.' 